Hello, everyone. On behalf of the College of Urgent Care Medicine and the Clinical Response Task Force, we're glad you're able to join us today. I am Laurel Steimanoff, and I would like to welcome you to our fourth Listserv Live session. Our moderator today is Dr. Sean McNeely. He is an urgent care fellow, former UCA board member and president. He is also the immediate past president of the College of Urgent Care Medicine's Board of Director and now chair of the Clinical Response Task Force. We are pleased to continue to present clinical updates, including today's presentations on oral therapies for COVID-19, as well as monoclonal antibody therapeutics. A few housekeeping items before we begin. We would like to continue our Listserv Live event format with the expectation that this will be interactive. Uh, we expect to have ample time for questions and comments after each of the speakers and then at the end as well. So please put your questions into the chat section of the Zoom menu on the bottom of your screen. They're being monitored by individuals on the call. Also, this session is being recorded and will be made available in the coming days. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. McNeely. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining. It's been more than a year since we've been battling coronavirus nationally. The challenges has been great. We've learned a lot. There is still much more for us to know, and the virus continues to adapt as we expected. Today, we will review potential treatments for outpatients, and if we have time, we'll discuss getting our asymptomatic but exposed patients back to work, school, or at least their regular activities. So first on our list, we'll be discussing some outpatient therapies. Um, Dr. Jeffrey Klausner, MD, MPH, is a professor of preventative medicine at the University of Southern California. Dr. Klausner currently directs a clinical research lab and serves as a principal investigator on several NIH-funded clinical research studies on STI testing and prevention globally. Dr. Klausner earned his medical degree from Cornell University Medical College in his master's in public health with a focus on international health and epidemiology at the Harvard School of Public Health. Dr. Klausner's research interests are in applied epidemiology and the prevention and control of infectious diseases of public health importance like HIV, STDs, SARS-CoV-2, tuberculosis, and cryptococcus. Dr. Klausner has a particular interest in the use of technology, information, digital, and laboratory to facilitate access to treatment for disadvantaged populations. With no further ado, Dr. Klausner. All right, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. So today I'm gonna give a presentation on oral therapies for early COVID-19 with the patient population being the ambulatory population prior to hospitalizations. I'm gonna review uh, some of the evidence, uh, current recommendations, and then uh, share in more detail um, a drug under current investigation. Next slide. So I have no specific financial disclosures relevant to today's uh, presentation, and I will um, give in, uh, I will be um, talking about investigational use of a uh, medication. Next slide. All right. So the drug that poisoned the well, essentially, for um, repurposing or looking at you know generally safe available medications, the first drug at Everyone has heard about, I'm sure, hydroxychloroquine or uh, chloroquine. So currently, the NIH guideline group says that that is not recommended. And the NIH guideline group is a group of infectious disease experts, um, internists, uh, pharmacologists who meet um, almost every week and review current data on uh, drug safety and drug efficacy and make recommendations, which are often um, um, implemented by a variety of uh, medical organizations. So the current NIH statement on hydroxychloroquine is that in non-hospitalized patients, the panel recommends against the use of chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine with or without azithromycin for the treatment of COVID-19, except in the setting of a clinical trial. It's a strong recommendation A uh, based on a moderate level of evidence 2A. Next. Next slide. Next slide. I'm working on it. I apologize. Got it. I don't know why it does this when we pull up these. 
There we go. Okay, so I just wanted to review two outpatient uh, hydroxychloroquine studies. One was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine last year by Skipper et al. This was a randomized trial of non-hospitalized patients with early COVID-19, randomized controlled trial of 431 patients placebo-controlled in the U.S. and Canada. And remember, randomized controlled trials, placebo-controlled, are highest uh, methodology or study design for determining if something is effective. In this study of outpatients, there was no difference in the incidence of hospitalization for patients in the hydroxychloroquine arm versus 10 patients in the placebo arm. That difference was not statistically significant. However, there was a higher percentage of patients in the hydrochloroquine arm that experienced adverse events versus patients in the placebo arm, 43% versus 22%. Next slide. Second negative hydroxychloroquine study was done in Spain by Mita et al. This was again a, a, a randomized controlled trial um, in 293 patients who got randomized to three different arms, 800 milligrams a day versus 400 versus none. And there was no significant difference in viral load reduction between the control arm and the hydroxychloroquine arms, and no difference in the risk of hospitalization between the control arm and the hydroxychloroquine arm. Arm, and there was no difference in the median time from randomization to the resolution of COVID-19 symptoms. So it was based on this evidence and then additional observational evidence that the NI Treatment Guidelines Group now recommends against the use of hydroxychloroquine in outpatients unless um, being used in a clinical trial. Next slide. So ivermectin, um, and uh, we know that ivermectin is uh, widely used um, around the world. We also know that people have, um, you know, different experiences with the use of ivermectin. Currently, the NIH guideline group states that there are insufficient data for the panel to recommend either for or against the use of ivermectin, and results from adequately powered, well-designed, and well-conducted clinical trials are needed to provide more specific evidence-based guidance on the role of ivermectin. Next slide. So um, this is one study. This was one uh, randomized controlled trial of ivermectin, a, um, a modest sample size um, that uh, randomized individuals to 12 milligrams uh, for three doses every 12 hours. And they looked at the proportion of asymptomatic patients at day seven and found no difference between the ivermectin and the uh, control arm, and any adverse um, events they had were attributed to the ivermectin arm in uh, eight patients. But again, this was a, a, a relatively small study of about 50 patients, and that honestly is some of the uh, challenges we have with evaluating the efficacy of ivermectin is the studies have been uh, small. Next slide. So I wanted to spend most discussion on fluvoxamine which is um, a, a current medication that has uh, been FDA approved for the use in obsessive compulsive disorder and depression and has been you know, safely used for more than 25 years. Um, so in January tw uh, 22nd, so uh, about two months ago, an expert meeting was uh, convened by myself and other colleagues from University of Minnesota, Washington University, included representatives from the CDC, from the NIH, from the Infectious Disease Society of America, and um, pharmacologists uh, as well, to review what was the state of the art of the uh, data on fluvoxamine uh, at the time. Next slide. So, you know, the first thing as a clinician, you want to know, well, you know, why should this drug work? What is its potential mechanism of action? So the main mechanism of action that we believe that fluvoxamine works is by what's called sigma-1 activation. Sigma-1 activation is a, uh, sigma-1 is a chaperone protein that sits next to the endoplasmic reticulum and is involved with the endoplasmic reticulum is the center of protein synthesis for cytokine um, uh, production and has a negative feedback. So when this um, protein is activated, it then reduces the cellular production of cytokines. Cytokines, as people uh, know, are the inflammatory mediators that really cause the disease 
in uh, COVID-19. So it's an inflammation that leads to, um, you know, pulmonary capillary leakage and uh, ARDS-like uh, syndrome. And the cytokines also lead to a uh, hypercoagulable uh, state as well. Other mechanisms that have been proposed include the inhibition of sphingomyelinase, which is an important uh, step for viral entry into the cell. Um, these fluvoxamines are uh, SSRI, serotonin uh, uh, reuptake uh, in inhibitors that also have been shown to inhibit hyperactivation of platelets and mast cells, which have been um, associated with increased clotting. And then fourthly, there's potential for the um, inhibition of the, of, the, of the metabolism of melatonin, which is also um, uh, involved with uh, clearance of uh, infection. So I'm just going to spend a little bit of time going through some of the scientific data to support these four different mechanisms. Next slide. Again, working on it. I think if we spend too much time on one slide, it just gets stuck. So, <laughs> oh, so frustrating. There we go. Okay, so this cartoon, uh, which was uh, published very recently, just basically goes over, you know, how SARS-CoV-2 virus enters the cell by bi binding the ACE2 uh, receptor. It gets endocytose within the cell. It then goes through a translation replication uh, process. It then um, um, uh, can activate or inhibit this sigma-1 uh, receptor, and that's what then stimulates this endoplasmic reticulum stress response, which leads to uh, cytokines. So I've circled the area where by blocking the sigma-1 uh, receptor, we may interfere with the stress response and the uh, or agonizing the sigma-1 receptor, we um, interfere with the stress response and reduce the uh, cytokine storm. Next slide. So uh, it's been known actually for many years that these uh, SSR1s, um, these antidepressants, uh, interact with the sigma-1 receptors. This is actually not uh, very new, but people were studying this mechanism for different purposes. So fluvoxamine um, is, is known to be one of the strongest agonists of this uh, sigma-1 receptor. Sertraline uh, is known as an antagonist and others um, like fluoxetine or, or uh, Prozac are known as weaker agonists of this receptor. Next slide. So uh, this was an uh, interesting report uh, where they gave fluvoxamine um, to mice in a mouse model of uh, septic shock. And the fluvoxamine treated mice had a much greater survival than the mice that were not treated with fluvoxamine. Next slide. And this basically shows the key finding. Um, fecal induced peritonitis is a animal model method for sepsis where you create peritonitis in the mouse by introducing fecal material. And you can see that the mice that received uh, fluvoxamine in the green line were much more likely to survive um, you know, at 150 hours versus those who were not given uh, fluvoxamine. So here is a very potent biological effect of fluvoxamine for inhibiting um, peritonitis associated sepsis. Next slide. And then I mentioned a second mechanism of inhibition of this sphingomyelase, which on your right, this is the point where uh, the virus, after binding to the uh, angi angiotensin converting enzyme receptor, starts to enter the cell. And by inhibiting this step, um, people believe that uh, th th this gives fluvoxamine an antiviral uh, activity by um, you know, inhibiting some of the steps of the viral. Uh, life cycle. Next slide. So th th this is just the scientific evidence that um, shows that um, on the right, you can see, um, you know, in the, in the absence of amitriptyline, which is also a syngomyelase um, inhibitor, you, you see the presence of infected cells, nasal epithelial cells with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. However, on the right, um, after the you know, presence of amitriptyline, you see the absence of infection. So scientific evidence that um, at least you know, in these cellular models, 
the, the drug does work to um, inhibit the life cycle and tracking of the virus. Next slide. So the third mechanism I mentioned was that fluvoxamine uh, may inhibit platelet activation through the inhibit, inhibition of serotonin uh, releases is uh, one of its known mechanisms as, as an antidepressant or an anti or you know for the management of obsessive compulsive disorder. We know that um, hypercoagulability you know plays an important role in the pathogenesis, particularly of uh, severe COVID-19. Next slide. And um, again, this slide just shows you, you know, some of the known mechanisms um, about how SSRIs um, inhibit uh, serotonin and how they impact uh, platelet function. And people know, may know that typically, you know, when people are going to surgery, uh, if it's safe to do, we generally try to uh, reduce or stop their SSRIs uh, before surgery because of this uh, property. Next slide. And, and, and then lastly, um, uh, melatonin, which um, is involved in the inflammation pathway um, by inhibiting uh, melatonin, it allows the prolonged duration of melatonin, which then serves to uh, ma maintain um, inflammation. Okay, let's move to uh, perhaps more interesting are the clinical data uh, regarding fluvoxamine. So the uh, first study uh, looked at fluvoxamine for early treatment of COVID-19. And honestly, you know, it was, it was on the basis of those scientific findings that the investigator, Eric Lenzi at, at Washington University, who is a psychiatrist, you know, thought that there may be benefit um, to the use of fluvoxamine. Next slide. So uh, the advantages to repurposing fluvoxamine is safety record is well known. It's been used since the 1990s. No fatality associated even in overdose. No QTC prolong prolongation, which had been a serious concern with hydroxychloroquine. It's inexpensive, widely available globally, easy to use, and um, well absorbed and uh, has uh, rapid uh, uptake. Next slide. So this first trial called the Stop COVID Trial 1, um, the idea was if ambulatory patients were given this drug, could it prevent clinical de deterioration? So they randomized 152 patients, 18 years of older, who were <coughs> SARS-CoV-2 positive. They had to be symptomatic for less than seven days. So that's an important aspect of the study population. They were symptomatic for less than seven days. Then they were randomized to fluvoxamine 103 times a day for about two weeks versus uh, placebo. And then they looked at what proportion clinically deteriorated, which meant they developed uh, shortness of breath um, with hospitalization or it decreased in oxygen saturation. And what was interesting was this was all done um, as a contactless trial. So this was all community-based people did the trial via uh, telehealth or tele-research and they got all the supplies and kits through the mail. They didn't have to physically go into any clinical study site. So the main finding, which was reported in JAMA in November, 2020, was that the fluvoxamine group actually had a 0% deterioration. No one randomized to fluvoxamine had any deterioration. However, those in the placebo group, six out of 72 deteriorated, including four out of six were hospitalized. So this is a small study, a pilot study, and, uh, but quite promising. So an example of clinical deterioration, this is a black non-Hispanic man in his late 60s, three days of symptoms. On baseline, when he enrolled in the study, at oxygen saturation of 96% and no shortness of breath. Two days later, he still had oxygen saturation 96%, but a moderate shortness of breath score. And on day three, he was admitted to the hospital, opacifications on x-ray, hospitalized, and received supplemental oxygen. So that was the typical course in the um, individuals who were hospitalized with deterioration. Next slide. Adverse events, and remember, it's always important, you know, when, when you're thinking about risk benefit, what are the adverse events of any uh, particular drug? And in general, uh, the uh, fluvoxamine had one serious adverse event, uh, 11 other minus events. 
There were six adverse events in the placebo group, including the hospitalizations, 12 other adverse events. So in general, uh, it was fairly equal and uh, well tolerated between the uh, two different groups. Next slide. All right, so what makes this story even more interesting, exciting, and uh, people may have seen the 60 Minutes episode on this about uh, three weeks ago. This was um, uh, on CBS News, was this observational cohort done in Golden Gate Fields, which is a racetrack in Berkeley, California, um, between November and December uh, 2020 by a South African research physician and clinician named David Seftel. Next slide. So Dr. Seftel had seen the uh, preliminary report um, in that JAMA study, and he was dealing with a large occupational outbreak of workers and trainers and jockeys at the horse, uh, at the horse racing track. Um, part of their procedures was to test employees on an ongoing regular basis, anyone who was positive by rapid antigen were confirmed by uh, PCR, and within a week he identified 113 individuals who were COVID PCR positive. He offered them the medication, uh, it was not a randomized trial, he said, I have this medication, here are the risks and benefits of the medication. I suggest you take it. 58% of people accepted it. 42% of people did not. He used a little bit lower dose. Um, instead of the 100 three times a day, he used 50 to 100 twice a day for uh, two weeks. Next slide. And the demographics of this uh, study population. So uh, most were uh, men um, in their 40s. Um, a quarter or more were uh, over the age of 50. High, uh, high majority were uh, uh, Latino men, which is uh, important, at least uh, in our epidemic in California and in Texas, uh, where a large majority of affected individuals are Latino. 25% um, to 30 plus percent had um, some chronic comorbidities like treated hypertension, uh, some diabetes, and actually, um, you know, that was a little bit higher in the uh, uh, no therapy group, um, or trend there at least. And then at the time of testing, um, um, there was a fairly equal um, distribution, but a little bit more commonly in the no therapy group um, that um, were asymptomatic. So about two thirds to a half had mild or moderate symptom. Next slide. So the key findings in terms of the clinical outcomes was that those who received fluvoxamine, even though they seem to be uh, a little bit uh, more symptomatic and a little bit sicker, 0% were hospitalized within 14 days. And among those who received no therapy, six out of 48 or 12 and a half percent were hospitalized. Uh, two uh, were uh, sent to the uh, ICU. And then at day 14, 100% of those who received the fluoxamine had uh, no persistent symptoms and 40% had no therapy. So, you know, when I saw these two studies, I thought, you know, this is too good to be true. I mean, I am an evidence-based uh, clinical scientist. I've been doing clinical research, randomized controlled trials for almost 30 years, and um, I'm always skeptical, you know, when I see small study with very positive findings, a second study, observational study with very positive findings, but this is what really got me to convene the NIH um, group and the CDC participants to really talk about these findings and see what we should be thinking about next steps. Next slide. So uh, the main next step, of course, is that, you know, researchers want to do more research. So uh, there is a now a larger uh, randomized controlled trial called the phase three trial, called, also called the Stop COVID Trial 2, also led by researchers at Washington University, essentially the same team. But now there are um, recruitment sites around the United States, but it's really open to anyone in the United States because it's contactless. So any patient can be referred to this site, and if they meet the eligibility criteria, which is age 30 years or greater, symptoms in the past seven days, um, they may be eligible 
for uh, this placebo-controlled randomized trial. And honestly, um, the NIH and other you know, august um, groups that recommend uh, treatment and um, it, um, interventions are waiting for the results of this uh, phase three trial. Um, but not everyone is waiting in terms of implementation. So as I mentioned, this is a decentralized clinical trial. Uh, but there are study sites across the U.S. and uh, Canada, national recruitment. Everything is done through FedEx in terms of specimen collection, medication, uh, supplies. And then it's funded by what's called the COVID Early Treatment Fund, uh, FAST Grants, and the Skoll Foundation. Next slide. So uh, in terms of some discussion and um, I think I'm wrapping up soon. So we have some questions that have come in and Dr. McNeely is going to moderate those questions. But um, I had posed in this editorial uh, back in the Washington Post uh, about two months ago now, you know, we have some potential existing drugs that could help. Um, you know, how much evidence do we need before we use something that's known to be safe? How much evidence do we need uh, to be able to start uh, using uh, certain medications and one urgent care group, which is how I got invited to this uh, presentation today through, uh, for the Urgent Care Association, has um, you know made an option uh, for certain patients to obtain fluvoxamine uh, City Health Urgent Care in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area. So uh, we have to remind people that fluvoxamine is not approved for COVID treatment by the FDA. Um, but physicians and clinicians are allowed to practice medicine um, and are allowed to, you know, prescribe medications, quote, you know, off-label. The FDA does not uh, regulate the practice of medicine, but the FDA does regulate the promotion and marketing of, of medications. So you do have to be careful, you know, as you communicate and talk about medications, are you marketing or promoting we're just, you know, doing best uh, practice and uh, clinical practice. Uh, I think I am there. Next slide. So I want to thank uh, Angela Rearson, who was one of the child psychiatrists who originally brought this idea of fluvoxamine to Dr. Eric Lenzi. Eric Lenzi, who's been leading these clinical trials, David Bulware and, and David Septel, who uh, reported on the study from Golden Gate Fields. Uh, Stephen Kirsch, who's the founder of the COVID Early Treatment Fund, which has, which is a philanthropic group that's been uh, funding some of these studies. And um, I give you my email uh, information if people have any specific questions. But let's turn to the questions that people have submitted and have uh, Dr. McNeely moderate that. And thank you very much. Thank you very much for that great information. We have several questions and we had some submitted beforehand. So can you comment on the recent observational study on baby aspirin improving outcomes? Have you had any, do you have any understanding of that? Yeah, so my understanding is that is that was in hospitalized patients. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, but you know, I was trying to limit the focus here to uh, non-hospitalized patients, but I think, you know, in, in the hospital, uh, we are giving, you know, usually low dose, you know, um, um, anticoagulation in the hospital. There have been studies on high dose anticoagulation. It was pretty mixed on the outcome of that, but our standard care in the hospital, they give uh, low dose anticoagulation. So aspirin probably, you know, works through a similar mechanism in, do, in, in, in reducing that, um, you know, pro, pro, um, pro coag pro-coagulation pro uh, state and uh, but I don't think um, that it's been used in um, you know outpatients but as John says here you know it is obviously very uh, inexpensive and you know over the counter um, but I don't think it's recommended um, for out outpatients but again you know people are open to practice medicine. Okay. Any data on patients who are already on fluoxetine or some other SSRI prior to becoming infected or do they not become infected? Yes. So actually that's where some of the other observational comes from France and um, 
maybe Spain as well, is that there was a French psych psychiatric hospital and they observed that certain patients uh, were getting infected but not getting sick. And the doctors and nurses and clinical staff were getting infected and getting sick. So they looked at the medications that those patients were on and they were all on SSRIs for different reasons. So that was some additional data that I didn't present as observed observational data that people on SSRIs tended to have better clinical outcomes. Um, there's no data that the SR SSRIs prevent infection because as I think the SSRIs primarily work by kind of dampening and uh, abrogating this kind of pro-inflammatory process. So, um, you know, I would think it would, it would turn, you know, asymptomatic, maintain asymptomatic or asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic into asymptomatic and prevent the more severe development of sequelae, which are related to that cytokine storm. Um, but yes, um, there have been studies um, outside the U.S. that have observed that as well. Okay. Is there any group of patients who this should be targeted towards or that seem to be more in need of a therapy like this? Certainly. So, you know, everything in medicine, we're always trying to, you know, look at the risk benefit, you know, so, you know, while there's, you know, very low risk to this medication, fluvoxamine or other, you know, medications, whether it be aspirin or, you know, whatever, there's always some risk. There's never zero risk. So I think you always have to balance, you know, between who is this likely to benefit the most. So um, I know in the urgent care uh, program that's run by, you um, the, the city health group in the San Francisco Bay Area, they are restricting it to people 65 years or older or those with comorbidities like, you know, treated diabetes, treated hypertension, or, um, you know, moderate obesity, I think a BMI of 35 or greater. Um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about opening up to potentially lower risk people, but we know from the data that age, body mass index, you know, diabetes, hypertension, those are really the four strongest risk factors, you know, for, for clinical deterioration. And age is probably the most strong um, out of those uh, four. So um, I do think it makes sense if you're going to consider using it, uh, to use it in the population that's at the highest risk for severe outcomes. Okay. Speaking of the drug itself, what are the general risks or what are we seeing with side effects and problems of patients receiving this medication, whether it be for COVID or for just in general? Yeah, on so one uh, common side effect for fluvoxamine is its interaction with caffeine and it seems to inhibit the metabolism of caffeine. So I uh, generally recommend if possible, people stop drinking coffee or caffeinated beverages or limit to one a day. And um, there have been reports about people who have had, you know, caffeine toxicity, um, you know, inability to sleep, um, agitation, tremulousness, et cetera, uh, that interaction. And then, um, you know, the other side effects people report is mouth. Um, some people with the initial dose report a little mild uh, dizziness. And that's actually why uh, now in clinical practice where it's being used, people are using a lower dose, 50 milligrams twice a day. And the 50 milligram twice a day dose seems to be sufficient um, that you don't have to use the uh, higher dose. Okay. Um, we are gonna be talking about monoclonal antibodies in a minute here. Has there been any comparison to it um, in monoclonal antibodies for at this at all? At this point, I know it's very early in uh, clinical right, trials. So the, the, the short answer is no. Uh, there have been, there are complicated uh, trials right now looking at, you know, hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, fluvoxamine, colchicine. I didn't mention colchicine earlier, but colchicine is also, you know, under study. There's been one negative study, large randomized controlled trial. Um, so people are looking at these in kind of a world design where people get randomized to different um, orders of the medication or different choices of the medication, um, but I've not seen any current studies looking at monoclonal antibody. Okay, so if I understand correctly, the, the 
mechanisms that everyone's kind of looking at with these medications is to reduce inflammation. We feel that these patients who have a worse outcome or a worse course are inflammation from the disease process, and these medications are interfering with the inflammation process. That's kind of the idea behind it. Correct. Okay. Any other additional thoughts on medications that are out there or on this particular medication that you want to share with our audience? Uh, well, I mean, you know, I think it's yeah, going back to editorial about, you know, how much evidence is needed. So for fluvoxamine, you know, we have this small RCT, randomized controlled trial. We have that observational study. We have good, you know, scientific rationale and evidence. And, um, you know, it might be worth trying and select, uh, you know, patient populations. I mean, we are, you know, struggling for available medications that we can use now. I mean, there are new, you know, molecular compounds, small molecules, you know, under development by NIH, you know, which are going through a traditional pharmaceutical development, you know, pathway, you know, safety studies in, in animals, phase one in humans, phase two, phase three. So, um, you know, I think, you know, this idea of repurposing medications has, you know, um, you know, it's intriguing and has, you know, a high likelihood of success if the medication works for availability and access, uh, you know, throughout the United States and in the rest of the uh, world. Um, you know, depending on proprietary new molecules, new medications, um, you know, just is a big challenge. I mean, I think remdesivir obviously is intravenous used in hospitalized patients they were talking about an oral version of remdesivir, but we really haven't, you know, seen that uh, become available um, yet. There are other antivirals that are, you know, in continued clinical development, but I think, you know, repurposing is an exciting, you know, way to study things quickly and have them immediately available. Um, there's a question about the dosing. So, correct. So, right now, the um, current dose that people are using is 50 milligrams twice a day for 14 days. And um, that seems to be the, you know, ideal amount of time to get people through this, um, you know, period of expected inflammation and uh, clinical deterioration. And, you know, it's completely anecdotal, but, you know, the people who have gotten the fluvoxamine, uh, have not had any long COVID. So, you know, we still don't know the mechanisms of the long COVID, whether it's due to inflammation, chronic, you know, viral replication in, in apartments of the body or something. But um, it seems that at least in the people who've been in the studies who have gotten the fluvoxamine, they haven't had any uh, long-term symptoms. Uh, no one has tried it as far as I know for the treatment of uh, long uh, COVID or long haul COVID either. Um, but, um, it, you know, could be, I guess, possibly, uh, you know, considered. Um, okay. All right. Seems like that's the end of our questions for this session. So we'll, if you just hang in there, we'll uh, mm -hmm. bring you back up at the end and see if we have a few more questions along the way. So we're gonna switch gears a little bit and we're gonna talk about monoclonal antibodies in the urgent care centers, which we've talked about before. Um, our next presenter, Dr. Sarah Schreiber, is currently the urgent care and infusion center lead of the COVID-19 therapeutics team at HHS ASPR. She received her PharmD from St. Louis College of Pharmacy. She completed a general practice residency at Cox Health Systems and a clinical research fellowship at UNC Chapel Hill before joining FDA as a clinical pharmacologist supporting hematology, oncology, drug development in the CDER. She now serves as a team lead in the Office of Biologicals and Biosimilars in the Office of New Drugs in CDER. Without further ado, we'll talk about that. Thanks, John, for the introduction. So to kickstart um, the presentation today, I'd like just to start with summarizing the available COVID-19 therapeutics. Um, these span certainly products that are FDA approved, um, issued under emergency use authorization, or included as recommendations in NIH guidelines. You can see the spectrum here um, between no illness and ICU admission. And if you look at the early symptomatic stage, um, 
for non-hospitalized patients, the only available therapies here are monoclonal antibodies. These, uh, the reasons that these were authorized was based on um, the potential to keep these high-risk patients out of the hospital. Um, these are certainly important um, medications and unique therapies um, as we um, handle the, the COVID-19 therapeutic um, pandemic. Next slide. So these three monoclonals, again, they've been granted emergency use for the treatment of COVID-19, again, based on their potential to reduce the progression to severe disease and hospitalization in our high-risk patients. Um, HHS Asper has been charged um, with the distribution of these therapies. And we're working to continue accelerating uptake of these therapies as they can have a significant public health impact. Our goal is to facilitate the effective use of these therapeutics um, to reduce COVID-19 hospitalizations. Next slide. So it's really important to understand the patient's journey um, and any potential barriers to treatment um, so that we can really in ensure that all of our high-risk patients um, have access to and are receiving treatment. So first, with the patient, we have to ensure that our high-risk patients are pre-educated, one, that there's treatment available um, ahead of their diagnosis. Once they, um, you know, proceed uh, with, with testing, once they become um, potentially COVID positive and they proceed to testing, they have to be, again, aware at the healthcare facility side that there is treatment available. And so one of the things that we can do to help in, um, enhance that is to have all of the urgent care facilities um, and, and doctor's offices just generally across the board, all the healthcare facilities, really to post information on their websites about the availability of monoclonals um, as a treatment option for COVID. We have to provide um, education to both patients and providers. Oh, um, thanks. <laughs> um, and direct our patients to these resources and treatment locations. They're, again, aware of where they can go to receive the treatment. So the healthcare facility can also help facilitate referring patients to the monoclonal treatment site. Um, so again, one of the barriers um, to treatment is scheduling patients at those infusion sites. And so as part of the um, referral process, as urgent cares are conducting, completing COVID testing, not all of them are currently involved in treatment administration, but certainly they can help facilitate um, screening of eligibility for monoclonal treatment as patients are being tested for COVID and helping with that referral process to um, local facilities that are engaged in administration of the monoclonal. Next slide. So there's a few things certainly that um, the urgent care providers can do to support the patient journey. One I mentioned already, supporting the referral pathway um, for these therapies. The urgent cares are a key source of COVID-19 testing and the providers there are a critical source of information to um, patients regarding the availability of these treatments. Um, so as patients are tested, um, we request that the providers share information with their patients about these therapies um, and help screen the patient for their eligibility to receive um, the treatment. Certainly any sites that um, are able to also be involved in the administration of the monoclonal is most welcome. Um, the test and treat model we found to be the highest success in ensuring that patients receive um, the, the needed treatment. Um, certainly there's staff and space issues that some sites encounter. And so again, uh, we ask that you consider whether or not you have the space um, and the staff's capacity to allow um, for administration of these products within your facilities. 
Um, ordering of products has become very easily. We have a direct ordering process um, to obtain um, these emergency use authorized monoclonals. And there's numerous resources um, available to sites um, that are interested in administration. We ask that you also um, reach out and share your experiences um, with the administration or, and or the referral process um, to support others in the administration. You can post information again online for patients to understand that one, you're, you're an administration site um, for their awareness, as well as just posting general information about the availability of monoclonals in the treatment of um, COVID-19. If you have any um, questions um, or you'd like to just have general outreach with us um, and network or contact us um, with any comments or concerns, you can reach us at our COVID-19 therapeutics at hhs.gov email. Um, and we look forward certainly to communicating with you directly on any front to help support um, your needs. Um, if you're considering um, beginning to administer monoclonals or if you're already involved in monoclonal treatment and you have any um, questions that come up, um, please, please reach out. We welcome feedback from you. Next slide. And lastly, I just wanted to share, um, as of yesterday, we've gone live with a new monoclonal call center um, where we have um, folks dedicated to answer questions and any information related to monoclonals, both in English and Spanish. Um, these information are available online at both the combatcovid.hhs.gov um, website as well as our phe.gov website. So um, we request certainly that um, you share all of um, these information about the monoclonal call centers with your stakeholders and your patients. Um, one of the main points um, of service for this call center is to help patients or family members of patients and providers identify um, administration sites and link patients up um, to receive treatment in their, in their local communities. So with that, um, I'll turn it back to Sean. Sure, the first uh, question we had was to please elaborate on resources available to sites interested in administration. What, uh, what's out there? Sure, thanks for that question. Um, so certainly we have a lot of um, information in terms of processes and how to get started and get set up um, in terms of equipment, um, flow, of um, flow of patients in and out of facilities potentially. Um, and, you know, again, depending on, um, I'm not sure what region uh, the, the participant is in, uh, we can certainly also help to provide um, outreach uh, and networking within that local community to understand if there's other facilities um, in your area that are also administering administering monoclonals in terms of the ability to form any collaborations there as well. Okay, so we had a question uh, regarding regarding um, copays and deductibles. People are saying that they're not seeing those being waived for these areas. Um, has that been your experience, or do you have any input on that? So certainly, I've heard third party um, about. Um, the private payers and insurance coverage. Um, unfortunately, HHS Aspirin government doesn't have um, control over that, but I can certainly comment, comment that from a CMS perspective, there is um, reimbursement that um, it's approximately $310 um, for the infusion um, of the product. Uh, the products are provided at no cost to sites and patients as they have been procured by the government. How does a clinician decide among the monoclonal antibodies choices in particular? So um, both, both products, um, combination products are available. Um, and, you know, I think they both perform similarly in terms of the data. Um, and so both are, both are made available. Um, okay. Um, so um, there are some areas in the country that there's some concern over certain any, uh, monoclonal antibodies not working as well against variants. Can you comment upon that? 
Sure. Um, so in terms of the variants, um, they are being surveillance, uh, surveyed and, and monitored by CDC. Um, and as recommendations, uh, updated recommendations come out, um, you know, we certainly, um, uh, I'm sorry, we certainly follow uh, those recommendations and convey that information out um, to, to the communities. Um, but at this point, um, my understanding is that for the, the main um, variants that have been identified, the combination treatments have been effective. Okay. So um, it was asked about the criteria for monoclonal antibodies. The college has put together both a table and a flow chart for that that we can add and send out to the attendees as well. But um, what are the main, who are the main groups that we're looking to give these monoclonal antibodies to? Who should the focus be on? Sure. So these, um, the emergency use authorization um, classifies these as high risk patients that are non hospitalized. So um, some of the criteria certainly are no more than 10 days from symptom onset with mild to moderate symptoms. Um, they, patients can either be vaccinated or unvaccinated. Um, and some of the other criteria that for high risk, I think uh, that was discussed in the prior presentation as well, um, certainly patients that are um, 65 years and older with chronic kidney disease or diabetes, um, body mass indexes over 35, um, immunosuppressive diseases and such. Um, and then, slightly younger patients, um, older than 55 or older, who have cardiovascular disease, hypertension, or COPD, or other types of respiratory um, chronic diseases. Um, younger adolescents um, are also eligible, patients 12 to 17, um, who have a, a variety of um, different criteria, again, that are outlined in the emergency use authorization. Okay. All right, thank you very much. So I'm going to give everybody one or two more minutes to send out any questions for our, for our two uh, presenters. Um, and if not, we'll uh, move on to just a, a brief informational on um, some updates to uh, asymptomatic exposure. I'm not seeing any questions here. Um, so we'll give uh, each of you uh, just a minute or so to talk. Uh, Dr. Klausner, any final comments? Um, for our team? Yeah, so I mean, I think uh, the idea is to watch this space with the uh, fluvoxamine in particular. Um, there is a, um, a trial that's supposed to be uh, reported by April 15th, which include fluvoxamine in one of the study arms. Um, and we are, um, you know, anxiously waiting the results of that. I mentioned that phase three trial, they will be taking early look at that um, um, about halfway through the number of events. So uh, that may be coming out soon. So um, I would look for, you know, updates from the NIH guidelines group or the Infectious Disease Society of America or other, you know, groups um, for their recommendations on the use of, uh, of uh, fluvoxamine. Um, you know, until there's some other, you know, stronger evidence, I think, um, you know, it's, it's a pause in general on, you know, hydroxychloroquine or um, um, ivermectin. And for culture scene, as I mentioned, the one high quality study, randomized controlled study, showed uh, no benefit. But I know outside the United States, people may be using that. Okay. And any final comments from Dr. Schreiber? No, I'd just like to thank, um, you know, all the Urgent Cares for their engagement and being so active um, and involved in the, in the treatment um, of the monoclonal therapies, um, and as well as um, their participation in the referral process to make sure and ensure that all of our high-risk patients um, have equitable access um, to these, to these much-needed therapies that I think are here to stay. Thank you both for coming on. So one more one more slide here before we end since we do have a few minutes left.
So asymptomatic expo exposed patients, that's those people who come in, um, someone exposed me to this, I need to get back to work or school. Um, just so that you're understanding, there was a big update from the CDC, I believe it was on the 17th of March. Um, I've got listed the information there as to what we're talking about um, related to when people can go back. So there's different categories. There's a fully immunized patient who's had either two or the single dose immunization and had some time a couple weeks afterwards to develop the immunity, those people can be returned back with the caveat that they have to stay away from people who are high risk. Um, people who have a tested antibody positive in the last 90 days for the nuclear, nuclear capsid or the spike proteins, um, they can be considered people who are less likely to spread disease. Um, on day five, um, there's the testing like we may be doing with our PCR to finding out if a person um, has, has the disease at that point and they can return after the seventh day if that test is negative. Um, there's the past uh, information we're on day 10. Um, they can consider to be returning with the caveat to watching others and wearing their mask as we normally would, or day 14 being our normal return to activity. So um, if you want to look at that, take a closer look at all the information behind that. I think it's a good idea and something very positive. I will turn this over to uh, Laurel, who can kind of send us out the door. Sure, thank you. Um, I think just one couple of final comments. First of all, I just want to thank all of the presenters today for, I, I found it really interesting in terms of, um, you know, what's new. And obviously, this is such a fluid uh, situation that it seems like, you know, what we're learning increases weekly. And, you know, I guess maybe the message is if you're going to get COVID, get it at the end of the end of COVID versus the beginning of COVID, <laughs> because we clearly have options available to us. Um, our next um, listserv live will take place probably, well, we're looking at right now April 21st. Once again, these are put on by the Clinical Response Task Force, and uh, we're going to actually shift away from COVID for this particular one. Um, it's really going to be based on best practices and opportunities to reevaluate, triage how you're handling vital signs within your centers. Um, and really uh, hopefully talking to some experts. And one of the things that the participants will all receive then is kind of a template um, policy that they could implement or customize to their centers in terms of uh, vital signs at triage. So we're looking forward to presenting that. Once again, it'll be April 21st, and um, there will be more coming out either via the listserv or you can expect to see it in UC Access. So with that, uh, this concludes today's uh, Listserv Live. Thank you, everyone, uh, speakers and attendees, for participating.